Good morning. My name is Jean-Michel Molina, and it's a pleasure to speak at this workshop today. And I would like to uh, thank uh, Wally for his kind invitation. So I've been asked to address the issue of STI prevention by doxycycline. So why discussing this issue in a workshop on HIV transmission? Well, the reason is um, when we conducted uh, PrEP studies in France back to uh, 2012, we have seen in this population of PrEP users a very high rate of STIs. And as you can see on these slides, uh, at the time we diagnosed only a handful of cases of HIV infection. We had uh, more than uh, 800 cases of uh, STI, mostly chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. So we wanted to uh, reduce uh, this uh, uh, incidence of uh, bacterial STIs in particular. And uh, we thought that in this population um, of PrEP users, the strategy of abstinence being faithful and condom use is probably not uh, optimal, although we still have to try to enforce condom use. Unfortunately, we don't have vaccines for bacterial STIs yet. And we are already implementing the test and treat strategy uh, by uh, testing these uh, individuals every three months for bacterial STIs and uh, uh, treating them uh, as soon as a diagnosis is made, although in most of the cases, uh, these individual, individuals are asymptomatic. We are already uh, enforcing uh, partner notification and treatment, and that's why we thought we may uh, test, in addition, antibiotic prophylaxis. So what are the data regarding STI prevention by doxycycline? And why testing doxycycline for uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. Well, uh, doxycycline, when you look at the literature, has already been successfully used for the prevention of Lyme disease and lactose paralysis. There was also, at the time we uh, conducted our, our study uh, in 2015-2016, a randomized study published among uh, 30 HIV-positive MSM with prior syphilis showing fewer STI in those using daily doxycycline. In addition, in France, there is a limited use of doxycycline for the treatment of bacterial infections, and doxycycline is mostly used for the treatment of acnea and malaria prophylaxis. Also, there is no known resistance to doxycycline in chlamydia and syphilis. And for gonorrhea, in France, we already have a very high rate of resistance, uh, even uh, of high level resistance. So we thought the PrEP Ipeget trial was a unique opportunity to assess a new strategy, and in particular, this post-exposure prophylaxis strategy for, with doxycycline. The first reason was that these participants were at very high risk of uh, bacterial STIs and that they were monitored every two months by uh, PCR testing. Also, uh, there was no access at the time the study started to PrEP with TDFFTC outside of the study, and so there was a very high retention rate expected. And finally, the participants, we just completed the double-blind phase of the PrEP study. We're very thankful to the team for the great results we obtained with on-demand PrEP with TDFFTC to prevent HIV acquisition, and they were ready to test a new intervention. And that's why we implemented during the open-label phase of the uh, ipeg study a randomized open-label trial of doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis in these individuals uh, still on PrEP with on-demand TDFFTC who were HIV negative. And these participants were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either on-demand PEP with doxycycline or no PEP. In the doxycycline arm, they were instructed to take two pills of 100 milligrams, so 200 milligrams at once within 24 hours after sex and no later than 72 hours. We had 116 participants in each arm and in those randomized to doxycycline, we asked them to limit the use of doxycycline to six pills per week to reduce uh, the risk of antibiotic pressure. And uh, on average, during the study, uh, the participants used the median of seven pills per month. They were tested every two months with serologic assays for syphilis and HIV. And in, that, in addition, they were tested by PCR every two months 
for chlamydia and syphilis in urine, uh, anal, and throat swabs. As you can see, when we look at the incidence of the first episode of gonorrhea in an intent to treat analysis, you see no difference in the uh, incidence, whether or not the participants were randomized to PEP or no PEP. If we look in more details, are all cases of gonorrheal infections during the study, you can see that overall there was no difference in the cumulative number of cases of gonorrhea. But if uh, you uh, focus uh, the analysis on uh, the anal and urine side, there might be a trend towards a reduced number of cases, especially in urine, and that might be related to the elimination of doxycycline through urine. We then try to assess uh, the antibiotic resistance to the uh, Neisseria gonorrhea isolates. Unfortunately, we only uh, were able to uh, get culture in a few participants. And in those participants uh, who, uh, in whom we detected tetracycline resistance at high levels, they were all randomized to the no PEP arm. We then tried to detect resistance using uh, genotypic testing assessing the presence of TETM or a mutation in the S10 proteins. And we have found a very high rate of resistance, 81.5% uh, of resistance. And in 15.8% of the cases, this was high level resistance, but there was again, no difference between arms uh, in the limited sample size here. Uh, I'd like to point out also that not all bacteria are the same regarding resistance to antibiotics. And indeed, for chlamydia, um, we have no reports of the tricycling resistance so far in humans. And there is only a, a report in pigs where uh, chlamydia suis was able to acquire an influx pump, the TETC gene, which was associated with uh, low level resistance to tetracycline. And in vitro, there was only, only a single instance in which it was possible to transfer uh, these genes from chlamydia suisse to chlamydia trachomatis. The same is true for syphilis. And after more than six decades of use of penicillin and tricycline for um, the treatment of uh, syphilis, we have seen no uh, resistance emerging. Although tricycline resistance remains a concern uh, since we've seen recently the emergence of azithromycin resistance. If you look at the Ipergay uh, doxy PEP study, you can see uh, that uh, when we assess the incidence of the first episode of chlamydia, we've seen a significant reduction and uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.3. Uh, there was a, an overall 70% uh, uh, relative reduction in uh, uh, chlamydia incidence with uh, doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. The same was true for syphilis with a reduction by more than 70% of the incidence of syphilis in the study, although the number of cases here was limited, as you can see on the slide. In terms of safety, the tolerability of uh, uh, doxy uh, PEP was pretty good. There were more uh, drug-related gastrointestinal adverse events. As you can see here, 24% of the participants in the doxy PEP arm as compared to 14% in the no PEP arm because these participants were still on TDFFTC for PrEP. So there was a higher rate of uh, drug-related uh, adverse events with PEP, mostly nausea, vomiting, and gastrointestinal pain. But only 7% of these individuals discontinue doxycycline because of uh, drug-related adverse events. Um, there was a, another report at CROI earlier this year of a randomized study assessing daily doxycycline for prophylaxis of STI in PrEP users. And Greenan and colleague um, uh, designed a randomized open label trial among MSM on PrEP who had a history of syphilis. And um, the randomization was immediate versus deferred. And the immediate arm, the participants received daily doxycycline, 100 milligram per day for 48 weeks. And in the deferred arm, uh, doxycycline was started only at week 24. And their report among the uh, 52 participants that there was a reduction of the ACTI incidence during the first 24 weeks, favoring the immediate arm, 
with an other ratio of 4.18, so a reduction by 80%. And this was mainly due to a strong reduction of the number of cases of chlamydia infection, as you can see, 10 in the deferred arm, none in the immediate arm. The numbers of cases with syphilis and gonorrhea were too small to uh, draw any conclusion. So in other words, this uh, study, although limited by the number of participants and role, showed a significant reduction uh, in the incidence of chlamydia infection. So in summary of doxycycline prophylaxis for STI, we could say that there is no or very limited effect on gonorrhea, but there is a strong reduction in the incidence of chlamydia and syphilis, which has to be confirmed in larger studies. The safety profile was acceptable with mild and moderate gastrointestinal adverse event. Unfortunately, the analysis of antibiotic resistance is uh, so far very limited, especially uh, to detect the emergence of resistance uh, uh, to uh, uh, doxycycline in chlamydia and syphilis. We have not assessed the impact of these prophylaxis on the human microbiome yet. And uh, the long-term benefit of uh, this strategy remains unknown. And that's why it's uh, not recommended to use uh, at this point the doxycycline prophylaxis for STI. And we, we need to wait for additional studies uh, to uh, make any recommendations. And we need to better assess the benefit-risk ratio. So uh, is antibiotic prophylaxis for STI a new strategy? Of course not. And uh, this strategy has been used as early as uh, 1943 uh, in the Navy to prevent uh, STIs uh, using either a sulfa drug or penicillin. And um, although there might be uh, uh, in these uh, studies a short-term benefit, uh, when there was a failure, the failure was associated with resistance. And with gonorrhea, we know that it's very easy to select resistance. There was also a, a trial uh, using minocycline uh, as a post-exposure prophylaxis to prevent gonorrhea in, in the Navy. And in this large placebo-controlled study published in the New England Journal in 1979, more than 1,000 uh, men were randomized to receive a, a median of eight hours after sexual intercourse 200 milligrams of minocycline or a placebo. And as you can see on the graph, um, there was a, a prophylactic efficacy of post-exposure prophylaxis that was related to uh, the uh, MIC, uh, to, uh, to the cycline. And the isolates from patients given post-exposure prophylaxis were more resistant. So overall, the uh, prophylaxis was associated with 50% uh, reduction in the uh, number of gonorrhea cases, but uh, because of the limited effectiveness and the uh, high rate of failure, um, this uh, strategy was not uh, used uh, for prevention. And indeed, when we looked at the adverse consequences of antibiotic prophylaxis um, for STIs, we know that short-term reduction in STI prevalence could be associated with the rebound to pre-intervention rate once the prophylaxis is discontinued with the potential selection of antibiotic resistance. There might be also sexual disinhibition uh, with these uh, strategies. Um, prophylaxis can be also associated with the change in STI prevention with a prolonged incubation period, a more frequent asymptomatic carrier state, which might be still associated with transmission and the emergence of new STI resistance to the chemical prophylaxis. Of course, there are tolerability issues and cost issues, but the main concern is clearly the selection of antibiotic resistance and the clonal dissemination of drug-resistant STI. And this is uh, particularly true with chlamydia and syphilis, uh, uh, for which uh, doxycycline remains uh, the first or second line treatment uh, in an era where we have still limited options. So uh, we uh, still have a number of uh, studies assessing the interest and use of doxycycline prophylaxis uh, among MSM today. And uh, on the top of the slide, two recent studies conducted in the US cross-sectional surveys among MSM using PrEP or MSM with HIV infection show that a large proportion from 67% to 84% of these men 
were ready to use um, uh, doxycycline PrEP. And, and actually, it was interesting to see in the second survey that uh, nearly 90% of the providers were also ready to prescribe um, prophylaxis if recommended by the CDC, but maybe of more concern, uh, more than 40% would be uh, also ready to use it, even if not recommended by CDC, although they had concerns toward uh, possible drug resistance. Two additional studies um, conducted uh, in the UK looked at the uh, uh, real use of doxycycline prophylaxis among PrEP users, and uh, the study conducted in uh, 2018 showed that 8% of MSM attending a PrEP clinic in London uh, reported the use of uh, doxy-PEP. Uh, the same was true in uh, 2021 in a larger survey in the UK. In France, the reported use of doxycycline uh, PEP was only 0.9% uh, uh, among a recent uh, PrEP study conducted in, in the Paris region. So what's next? Uh, the slide summarizes five large uh, uh, studies uh, assessing uh, prophylaxis with doxycycline of STI. The first in Canada, the DISCO trial randomized uh, nearly 500 MSM in three arms, daily doxy, uh, doxypep, and no intervention. The second study was, uh, is conducted among uh, uh, women using PrEP in Kenya. The third study, a uh, large study in, uh, in the US, nearly 800 MSM randomized to doxypep or no intervention. In Australia, an observational cohort study of daily doxycycline uh, assessing the incidence of STI among MSM uh, in uh, New South Wales. And the last study in France, the Doxivac trial, a randomized uh, uh, study with a factorial design assessing doxypep and the meningococcal B vaccine, Bexero, on STI uh, incidence. So it's likely that within the next a couple of years, we will have uh, a number of studies uh, to uh, make a better recommendation on the use of uh, this uh, doxy prophylaxis or not. So in summary, uh, uh, we know that antibiotic prophylaxis for STIs, even when highly successful in the short term, usually provide only transient benefits. So we have to be careful and analyze in, in, in details all these uh, ongoing studies assessing uh, doxy prophylaxis. So far, this uh, prophylaxis with uh, doxycycline is not recommended, therefore. And um, this is because we are concerned by the selection and potential dissemination of antibiotic resistant STI, in particular syphilis and chlamydia resistance to, to doxycycline. And indeed, the short term benefits of these uh, strategies should be weighted against the long term consequences for the community. Potentially, if these trials are successful, we may think of carefully supervised but temporary intervention uh, to be tested if included in a comprehensive prevention package in population with a very high incidence, let's say, of syphilis. But I think the uh, take home message is that we need to foster research in STI prevention and develop bacterial vaccines for gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia if we want to achieve the WHO sustainable goal of ending STI by 2030 and uh, to reduce uh, by 90% the incidence of STI. With that, I stop here and thank you for your attention.